Hi, welcome to my new series, Embedded Programming. And this is the first episode in that series. In this episode, what I want to do is talk to you about Formatter and how to set it up on an Arduino board. So what we're going to look at is the motivation for the Formatter protocol. And this is going to be very high level. And then I'll talk about and show how I got it installed in, on my Arduino board. In other episode, I'll show how to install it on ESP8266 and Raspberry Pi and um, TI board if it's gonna if I can get it to work there, and also BeagleBone board, which I which I know it works on. So we'll see. We'll install a few different boards, and then we'll you know demonstrate by format of protocol install on a number of different types of boards how it makes writing application to control those boards very straightforward and easy, and I'll explain why in a bit. To install Formato, we look at two ways of doing it. You can install it through your Arduino um, IDE, um, especially if you're using uh, Arduino type board. So that would be Arduino boards or like my ESP8266, which is sort of like an Arduino. And then there's another way um, using this program called Gort, um, which is sort of tied, I believe, to the GoBot, which is what we're going to look at later on. I haven't explained GoBot yet. And but there, there are two, essentially two ways of installing Formato. Once you have it installed, we're going to be able to use Go to write um, code for our boards. And the reason we can do that is not that the Go code is compiled and run on the board, but rather the Go code uses the Formato library and sends the command to your board. And that's where the Formato adapter on the board um, does the stuff for you. A lot of this doesn't make sense. So if you don't know what embedded programming is, let me show you a few embedded boards and basically tell you that embedded programming is simply when you write code for embedded boards. So what is this an, an embedded board? Let me show you. There is a BeagleBone and is a TI Launchpad. And I have a ton of other not a ton, but a lot. I have my two micro bits over here. I have Arduino over there. A ESP8266. And I'll get back to why I have it set up in this rather weird way. And that's going to be in a future video where I'll use some Go programming to control that motor. And we're going to spin it and stuff like that. So that's something a work in progress. And the intent, of course, as you can clearly see, is to try and get a remote control robot. But we'll get back to that. There's a Raspberry Pi. And that's the Raspberry 8 as one of the very first one. And there is a Raspberry Zero with a Raspberry camera. And right now that's running Node Red. And it can take picture. I can send it up to Google Vision API and get some label for that picture. And I'll show you that all in a future video. So embedded programming is really just writing code for these little microcontrollers with peripherals. And a microcontroller is really, really just a very, very scaled down um, processor that does some specific things and have some integrated peripherals or maybe some peripherals outside of it that you can access. So now I've shown you a few of my embedded boards. These are not the exact number of peripherals or number of pulse width modulation ports or anything or an digital port that my boards have, but it's just for illustration purposes. So what is formatter? So imagine that I had a few boards. So an Arduino, a Raspberry Pi, and a BeagleBone board. And like I said, each board have different set of capabilities, whether it's in CPU speed and all this other stuff. Now, there's a distinction to be made between um, boards with microcontrollers, which are like your Raspberry Pi, um, well not Raspberry Pi so much, but Arduino, which are really s slow, like, um, you know, there may be five megahertz or something like that. And something like a Raspberry Pi and a BeagleBone, which can actually run a full version of, um, full blown version of Linux and can actually work as more like a mini computer. You can attach a monitor and a keyboard to them. Most traditional um, embedded board doesn't support driving a monitor. They don't have a display driver. Even though they're so capable as mini computers, we still consider them 
embedded boards because they are using sort of the same space which a traditional um, microcontrollers, which would be not as general purpose and are usually are generally used for OM automation project, robotics project, and so on. But these boards are still very powerful, but they're still used in the same way. So for us, we're going to consider Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and BeagleBone all embedded boards, even though we can say, well, Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone boards are more like mini computers. So, okay, so they have different capabilities. And so in terms of talking about how do you program these boards, well, um, they might use, uh, let's say in Arduino, you'd use a subset of C++ called this process language. Um, and But they don't really call it process language there, but um, it's very similar to the process language. And But it's a subset of C++ that's sort of hidden from Mio. Uh, but it is C++. And then on a Raspberry Pi, you can use even Lula, um, Lua, you can use um, Ruby, but generally most people use like C++ again, the subset of C++ and Python. On the BeagleBone, because it's running a full-blown version of um, Linux and how it integrates its GPIO and the drivers are set up, Raspberry Pi also run a full-blown version of Linux, Raspbian is the one of the default, but on BeagleBone, you can use C++, Python, and a, whole, a number of other things, including even Bash Shell to, believe it or not, um, manipulate the GPIO pins and other devices that are attached to the BeagleBone. But the problem here is not so much the language, but it, it, the different way in which you can control the devices. So even though the BeagleBone is integrated nicely with the Linux device system, on the Raspberry Pi, Pi it's not quite the same way. And for the Arduino, it's certainly not because you don't have a full-blown operating system like Linux anyway. So even if you might use the same language, the way in which you say, let's say, blink an LED or configure GPIO or pulse rate modulation um, is, is still going to be different, even if you have the same language support across these boards. And so if you own these boards, I said these boards like I do, and you, let's say, know C++, you still have to learn the different ways in which you can control them. And so the question is, is there a better way in which you can leverage all your different boards because they might have different capabilities that you actually want? And the answer is yes, Formatter. So what is Formatter? And I grabbed this from the Formatter um, GitHub page and just stuck it right in here and just highlighted a few places. So I'll read it for you. It says, Formatter is a protocol. Keep that in mind. Formatter is a protocol for communicating with microcontrollers. Now, I said earlier that you could draw a distinction between Arduino and Raspberry Pi. One is a microcontroller, the other one is sort of a general purpose computer. But for the most part, because of how people use them, we just call them all microcontrollers. From software on a computer or a smartphone, tablet, etc. So notice, it's just a protocol that you're gonna use to talk to your microcontroller from some piece of software that's running somewhere else, okay? The protocol can be implemented in firmware on the microcontroller as well as in software. Okay, now, what does this give us? So once I can separate uh, how I control my board into um, just using some protocol, then I don't have to worry about the details of that board. And so now what we have is on my different board, Formatter could be installed into that board. Now Formatter is able to control the devices on that board. Device is gonna be GPIO, audio, video, whatever it is that that board has, uh, real-time clock, pulse rate modulation, whatever capabilities are available on that board, Formatter protocol properly implemented for that board will be able to control those devices available on the board. The advantage for this now is that I can use a Formatter client library running on my host computer that can then send the information to my board. Now, if my formatted client library is implemented in JavaScript or is exported or allow me to use it from JavaScript, C++, Python, Go, I can still use the language that I know. So imagine that I know C++, that now I can use C++ with the formatted client library in a consistent way. So I no longer have to worry that on bigger bone, I need to go to the Linux device file system to access the GPIO or on Raspberry Pi, I need to do it some other way, or on Arduino, you need to do it some other way, even though it's still C++. With C++ and the Formatter library, I use it in one consistent way. We'll see that. And so the Formatter client library now connects to my board over 
whatever mechanism I can use depending on that board. So for Arduino, that's typically like U, um, USB. Um, but it's also possible that I may be able to write a little sketch, I think they call it, like a formatted sketch that I can then upload to the board. I can also, if my board is like a bigger bone or my ESP8266 that has TCP and Wi-Fi, well, I can just connect to it over TCP. And so now my board can be anywhere so long as I can reach it over TCP and I can read data from the board and all this other stuff. And so this is why I think format is really cool because it raised the level of abstraction and detail in terms of what, how we need to program and, and work with our boards. So now that we have some idea of what formatter gives us the benefit, we'll start with my Arduino board and let's see if we can get formatter installed. And we'll do that by first trying to install and let you the an Arduino IDE. If you look at my screen, what is supposed to happen is this. I'm supposed to be able to, when I plug in my USB device, it's supposed to have a new device show up here. And as you can see, there are two devices there, but let's watch the, that list of devices. And I'm on a Mac, but if you're on Linux, you can do something like this. For Windows, you can just go to devices and then look at the ports. And then you can see when you plug in the device, your USB device, which ports it shows up on. And so mine is obviously not showing up here and I'm going through a hub, but I know this works on another laptop, but I'll try it by plugging it directly into my computer. And same thing, nothing, all right? Um, so um, it's not the hub that's the problem. So I just switch it from the hub to my, plug it into my computer and then back to the hub because I know it works on another computer going through this hub. And so this problem, is something that you'll find a number of people complain about. Um, if you go online and you search for, you know, Arduino not showing up on Mac or something like that, you'll find a lot of people complaining about this. And the number of forums, as you can see, I visited some of them, and they're telling you all sort of different things to do, um, whether it's to install some driver from someplace. And I would say this is the thing you probably want to do, is this FTDI chip that come that driver is probably the only thing I would say you should install. So I would say if you're having this problem where you plug in your Arduino and you cannot find a device for it, then you try first rebooting with the device plugin, still see if that see if that resolve your problem. If it doesn't, then like in my case it does, it didn't, then come to installing this chip. Now how do I know how this is FD FTDI chip I'm using? Well if I instead run this other command and this IO command, and this is on Mac, so you shouldn't have this issue in Linux and Windows, is, you'll, you might have to install a driver too. Um, but you can see all this information about all the USB devices that are plugged into my computer camera and um, you know my microphone and so on. But I could sort of put this through said, if you don't know said, don't worry about it. Um, but basically I could filter out the information I want. And so now you can see, I'm just looking for like the name of the devices and I can wrap this in a watch command. And if I do that, now it will keep watching um, this list of the USB devices. And you can see when I pull this out, if you look at my screen, you'll see in a minute, um, I have one less item in my list and I plug it in. So the my computer or OS is detecting this FTD 32 UART. And so we can highlight this and we can go search online. And you can see how, you know, you can go to SparkFunk or any other place, but notice it takes you back to this same FTD IC chip driver website. Okay. So that's another way you can get you find your way here. And once you're here, no, you can, um, and that's pretty small, but I would rather just come down here. And so I'm on Mac, um, three to eight, no, nine and above. So here, and I'll come and, okay, this driver is signed by Apple. So that's good. I'll click on this and it's downloading. I'll click there and let's see. Um, the last time I actually used my Arduino is about two years ago. I've been using some other devices, my Raspberry Pi and the ESP8266, which we'll get to, I keep mentioning, but anyway, so let's see if this works. So I'll follow the installation. 
the reason why I'm showing you this is because I don't like those videos that says, okay, I'll show you how to set up Arduino or Raspberry Pi or whatever it is, or I'll show you how to do X, Y, and Z, and then they skip all these steps. My video might be a lot longer, but hopefully you actually see step by step and you can forward through the parts that are boring and too long. Um, so no, I'm not interested in this because I see my computer is registering, it's showing that um, it detects the device. What I really want to see is this. So let's see if um, I, there's a good chance that if I install this driver, I might have to reboot. I'll fast forward through this bit because you don't really need to see this long boring install. And I'll show you again when the installation is completed. So now we are at the end and uh, installation is successful. And so I can move this to the trash because I don't need it anymore. And it doesn't tell me I should reboot, but so far I don't see anything new there. So let's plug this out, plug it in to see if that triggers loading, um, creating a device. Um, uh, I will just re restart. So I'll go reboot my computer and come back and see if it works. So I'm back. I restarted my computer. And so here I'm at a command line. So let's see if it's there now. So I'll rerun that watch command. And there it is. Notice how before I have this new thing. And I can plug this out and plug this in. And so we can see. So now I have a device. Great. The first thing you want to do is make sure you have a device. Because if you don't have a device, it doesn't matter if you go install the software. Because then you, there's nothing for you to, to connect to. All right, once we have a device, now we could we have some options. You can go to the Arduino website and go to software and you could use their online tool or you can download. Now, if you use the online tool, what that allows you to do is to be able to write code in an editor online, save it in the cloud, all this fancy stuff, share it with other people, import examples and all these other things. And by the way, the software that we're going to install, if you install it on your computer, has a ton of examples also. So I, I have an online account. You have to create an online account, of course, to use the online tool. It's up to you. We might take a look at that. But for now, I'll go with the downloads. And if you click on download and get um, the R, download the Arduino IDE, and you can see here, click on the appropriate one. I've already clicked and downloaded mine. And so it's a zip file that comes down as Arduino blah, blah, blah version, macOS.zip. Now, once you have that, you can unzip it. So I will close this for now. And I'll simply go to my download directory. And there is the Arduino for Mac. Now, um, if you're on a Mac, um, there used to be an issue with the earlier version of zip on Mac and unzip, where it couldn't unzip really large files correctly. Um, so I use 7-zip, and then I do extract, say Arduino. If I don't know if they fixed that issue, um, but that's just what I do. Um, however, unzip the archive that you get for your platform and simply put it in place. Um, for Windows users, let me just put it in some directory that's within your path or add it to your path. For us Mac folks, once I unzip it, I have this one thing that looks like one app, it says an application. And so I simply drag it and drop it in the application directory. And because I already added install, I'll just simply say replace. And that's all there is to it. Because I added before, I already have a link for it here. But if you're on Mac and this is your first time, just open up Spotlight and search for it and run it, okay? Once you start it up, so let's click on this. Once you start it up, um, it's gonna take a while, load some things. And by default, it's going to, I think, come up with either a blank or this blink. But because I was using it before, um, it's loading this blink example. But let's say it does not have the blink example. Let's say it started up with a new file that looks something like this. Let's just say that's what it started with. Don't worry. Remember I said that for Arduino, you essentially program in, in C++. And what they give you are these two functions, a setup function, and it tells you this function run once, and a loop function, which run repeatedly. And so let's say you have this blank screen. What you do is you go to File, and you say Examples, Basic, and there you go, Blink. And you open up that Blink example. 
and notice you, if you want you can get rid of all this other stuff and the uh, examples are read only so you can feel free to modify them because when you go to save them it's going to force you to save it on your own directory those are all comments if you don't know c or c plus plus programming but those are comment and notice we have the setup function and it says call this function called pin mode which you don't need to install anything it's just available for you pin mode and led built in led built in is there's an led on this board and it's tied to one of the gpio pins already and so led built in is going to be defined correctly for whichever board you select which we will select we haven't selected our board yet but we will in a minute i'll show you how to do it so even if i connect my esp8266 which i keep mentioning um to this led built in is going to be defined appropriately for that board once i select that board so you need not worry about which exact pin it is of course you can look up in the source to see or the library to see which button that is but for the arduino this is usually pin 13 i believe anyway we said configure our pin mode or pin or built-in pin led pin for output which is what we want to do we want to be able to drive the value on that pin so that means it must be configured for output if you want to be able to read the value let's say from a thermometer or something else we would configure it for input um, we say a digital high which is usually 5 volt but it can be like 3.3 volt uh, 5 volts is high low volts is 0 and if you think in binary it's high is just 1 low is 0 and so if we have an LED connected to that that LED is going to be on and we turn it off wait another second and so this is in milliseconds okay so a thousand milliseconds is one second so let's just simply upload this to our board and run it but before we do this is the upload command there is a verify and of course we can do a new file we can open files and we can save we haven't made any modifications so there's nothing to save how do we ensure that we have the correct board so you can see here because i used this before um, this is the board I selected for mine, but the port is wrong because it keeps changing that port number I don't know why but this is what you do you go to tools and You go to boards first and you select the boards that you have but since I'm using my Arduino um, And this is the one I have I can see the name here this um Dumilnov or whatever you pronounce it. I selected that and then I go back and I say tool after I select my board processor again if i look on the back mine is the at mega 328 so i have that selected and then port if i go to the port you can see all the ports listed and notice there's that weird port now right now it has something else so i select the correct port and there you can see it reflected at bottom unfortunately the arduino idea can't um, make this any bigger so now that I have that selected, once you do that, just hit this button. It's going to say compile, compile and sketch. That's fine. I can say okay, and it's going to compile, and then you'll see it's going to say uploading. So done uploading. Actually, it's um, it uploaded. It happened really fast, and you can see that LED is blinking. Um, so we can know that's the LED because I'll change the code here, and instead of every one second. So one Mississippi on, one Mississippi off. I will make it blink a little bit faster by putting this as 500, which is half a second, and this as 500. And so we'll upload again. And you see it's uploaded. There you go. And then now it's, notice how it's blinking a little bit faster. All right. Um, let's make it blink even faster. And we don't have to keep it on and off the same time. I'll just change how long I keep it on to half a second and how long we keep it off to 200 milliseconds so it should be on longer than it is off um, off and this is the key to something called pulse width modulation which we will talk about in a few videos from now where we talk about how to control that motor and how to drive it so as you can see um, now it's on and for longer than it's off okay and so that's the basic of connecting to your Arduino, installing um, the driver and connecting. But we still don't have Formatter installed yet.